I'm Cameron Strang, and welcome to Unedited. My guest today is one of the most influential people in fashion right now, Jerry Lorenzo. He got a start designing for celebrities and athletes, even working with Kanye. Out of that, he launched his label, Fear of God, which has streetwear and vintage 90s influences, but is high fashion. It's groundbreaking design. Fear of God recently released its sixth collection and its first collaboration with Nike on a new shoe line, which blew up. Jerry's involved in every aspect of Fear of God's business, from designing the line, to hiring the team, to juggling the partnerships and protecting his vision. And in the midst of that, he's a family man, and he's one of the most outspoken Christians you'll meet. He doesn't do a lot of media, but I recently flew to LA to visit Jerry at Fear of God's studio to talk about his story, faith, the pressure of success, and his vision for the future. If you've seen the new issue of Relevant, uh, you know we did a cover story on Jerry in Fear of God. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. He gave us total access and really opened up in a meaningful way. What you're about to hear is a portion of that conversation from their creative studio, a renovated warehouse in LA's hip design district. Without any further ado, here is Fear of God founder, visionary, and designer, Jerry Lorenzo. So your dad was a professional baseball player. That's crazy. Tell me about family life growing up. Um, family life growing up. Um, I guess we can start like Florida days. And I, we moved from Sacramento, California to uh, West Palm Beach, Florida in uh, like 87 or 88. So he was playing ball? He was uh, the minor league field coordinator for the March Hall Expos. And so they had their spring training in West Palm Beach. And by us moving to Florida would give us two and a half more months with him a year. Um, and by, by living in Florida versus living in, in California. So my mom and dad moved us to Florida to give us that more time with our dad throughout the year because they did, had spring training there. How many kids? Uh, there was four of us. My older sister, Angela, um, then, then myself. Then I have a little brother, Anthony and baby sister Natalie. Was anybody athletic? Kind of for the most part. Like uh, No one maybe went as far as like Angela did. Uh, Anthony played minor league baseball. So he, he kind of went, he didn't make it to the big leagues, but he, he was in the minor leagues for a while. Um, we were all pretty athletic. None of us dominant, but we could kind of play whatever we wanted. So for me, like I played basketball in high school played baseball in college, um, didn't dominate, but could compete with whatever I put my mind to. So Okay, so what's your first love sports-wise? I mean, if you look today, it looks like basketball. Yeah, I mean, because basketball was kind of my, in, in high school, it's what I played. I didn't play baseball until college. So it was kind of like uh, in, in basketball or in high school, like I, I, I still had this dream that I could make it to the NBA you're not all the way developed mentally <laughs> even though I was like 5'9 it was just it was you know maybe maybe I'm gonna grow maybe I'm gonna get bigger then I went to ORU and the point guards were like 6'1 6'2 and I was like alright I get it and I went to go play I walked on the baseball team why'd you leave? Um, I went to Florida A&M and I I thought I was gonna get more playing time and I was like you know what I, I think I I think I like this baseball thing. I'm going to start taking it seriously. I'm going to go or I think I'm going to play. And um, I didn't see that. The writing was kind of on the wall at ORU. Uh, I was closer to home. I wanted I wanted a black college experience. Uh, Marquise Grissom, who played for my dad with the Expos, played at Florida A&M, and Andre Dawson also. And those guys kind of, like, talked me in that, that experience. Back then, 95, like, the entire baseball team was black. You know, fast forward now, 2019, I think there's like maybe one or two black guys on the Florida A&M baseball team. It's like all white kids now. So you grew up in a strong Christian home. You went to Christian college for a while. Your sister went to Christian college. I mean, it's in you guys. Talk to me about your faith journey, like how it kind of became your own. Yeah, kind of getting back to where we were earlier in the story. Like I remember my faith journey really starting uh, when we moved to Florida 
and we would drive, you know, all the way on the weekends. We went to like the more of like a black, an all black church, but my school, um, for the most part, was like an all white school uh, out in Wellington High School. Um, and so I had this like um, juxtaposition on the weekends where I was at an all black church and kind of like the southern field church, and then during the week was at in high school with a you know some grungy Kurt Cobain type kids um, of the 90s um, and that's kind of like when it was my dad was on the road with baseball and my mom was just like taking us to church every weekend you know and my, and my mom's got praise music in the house and you know every night at the dinner table devotions and you know just like during that time when my family left Sacramento and moved to Florida when we just had our immediate family is when we really watched our mom kind of become the rock of of our household spiritually and so um, even even during that time um, I would say my dad just started to to kind of devote his life to Christ and like during high school uh, before high school this is maybe like junior high and and in late 80s, I think I did like my last year elementary school in Florida. So those early times in Florida is my mom kind of, I remember her just being the rock of, a, of our family spiritually. And, um, you know, all of those um, spiritual life lessons, you know, it, it, it says in the Bible, you know, raise a, a child up in the way that he should go and he'll, he'll never turn from it. And if he does turn, he'll, he'll, he'll come back, you know. And so I've just had these um, spiritual roots in my life um, and, and, and have you part to, to my mom's obedience and dedication to, to, to keeping us uh, spiritually grounded kind of in this wilderness time of Florida. Sometimes, though, that kind of heavy-handed Christian parenting pushes kids away, though. I mean... It, it pushes kids away. I think. I think for me, like I, you know, all through like high school and stuff, like I would, you know, I, I never drank and um, uh, remained pure through high school, and you know, it kept me grounded. I think it wasn't until uh, like graduate school or when I moved to, to California later in life where I started to kind of experiment and um, not. I was never. Um, turned off I knew what the truth was you know I knew what the foundation was but I, I still wanted to explore some things on my own um, but we never experienced faith in a way that we um, were turned off by it or or didn't want to uh, adhere to what we knew what the truth was so it's like you're kind of like living differently like you know you're not living the way you should exactly so I, I always knew you know, even you know, even when I later in life, when I moved to California and I started throwing parties, and my dad was managing the White Sox, I, that's why I used Jerry Lorenzo because I didn't want people to Google Jerry Manuel Jr. and see a club promoter, <laughs> and then, and then see the manager of the White Sox, this integrous guy that like doesn't curse and doesn't drink, and like who has a son that's out in California throwing parties. So I started using my middle name. Did that cause friction with your family? Me throwing parties? Yeah. Not really. I mean, they just kind of, I think my mom and dad knew that it was just something I was going through. I think they really were at peace with, um, with what was planted, who I was, really. You know, they, I, I, I think, I don't remember a time when they were just like so dishonored by it. It was more me, like, I, I don't want to dishonor all that they built or all that my dad was doing in baseball by me being this club promoter out five nights a week partying and drinking and inviting people to to Hollywood parties. Do you know Scott Harrison, Charity Water? Uh, I met him I met him in um, I met him at the uh, Hillsong Conference. He's got like a similar story and it's like you by throwing parties in LA it's like man it's like it's like wow I've got this influence like I can I can get people out four or five nights a week um, without really having to beg them to come out, I just knew I was providing something that they wanted. And, you know, I knew that if I could provide up, do that same uh, 
service but through product whether it's clothing or whatever it may be um, I kind of knew that the influence of the favor would be on that it's like a lot of these different life lessons that gave me the conviction that I could start a clothing brand later in life but when you got out of grad school you were going sports yeah I was going yeah I was going to sports sports management I went to the Dodgers front office and at that time I just you know being a young black kid and finishing um, grad school, I really thought my only chance at corporate America was doing whatever my dad did. I didn't think that I could go start my own business. I didn't think that I had the, the foundation to go do anything outside of baseball. So I got my MBA and my dad's in baseball. I got a good shot at getting a job in baseball. And that I was very close-minded in that sense that hopefully someone could open a door. So tell me about like, okay, the managing and then like throwing the parties. And then like, I I read that when you were managing some guys, you were like also working on styling them. Yeah. So after, after grad school, um, um, I went to work for the LA Dodgers front office. I did that from 2004 to 2007. At the end of 2007, I also started throwing parties, but then I had to move to Chicago for a year. I worked for a sports management firm in Chicago for a year. Um, and was coming back to LA like maybe once or twice a month and, and still doing these like monthly, weekly parties. Ended up moving back to LA in like 2000, end of 2007, 2008. And at that time, started promoting and doing parties full time and took my sports background and was managing uh, Matt Kemp at the time who was playing for the Dodgers and was starting to blow up. I think he almost won the MVP one of those years. It was like dating Rihanna. And and I just, I thought that, you know, I'm going to start branding the next, like, King Griffey Jr. But you were doing the parties full-time. I was doing the parties full-time and managing Matt. Um, and I'm using all of my marketing skills and bringing him endorsements. And I'm also doing his styling and just full image marketing with and being kind of a consultant growing up in baseball, being able to talk to him and understand what he's going through. There were lots of buckets that I could pull from to to kind of help him with his career. Um, But was that like your first step tangibly into the fashion lane? No, my first step tangibly into the fashion lane was in in grad school when I was working retail. So all through grad school, I worked retail. In Chicago, I worked at um, Diesel in Chicago. This is like late 90s, um, early 2000s, early... 2000s, I finished grad school in Loyola, uh, Marymount in LA when I moved to LA and uh, worked at Diesel again and Dolce & Gabbana. Um, prior to that, through college, I worked at The Gap. Um, and so I had gained all this knowledge of knowing what people wanted by being on my feet working retail. And um, I just I knew what people were looking for when they were shopping. I knew what was missing from their closet. I knew what looked good on them. And then fast forward to to styling and working with Matt, um, I kind of had this knack of knowing what was missing from his co- closet just from like working retail all these past years. Um, also, at that time, a lot of the guys that were going to my parties were brand owners, and they were, like, streetwear brand owners. So, like, Crooks and Castles, Diamond Supply, um, uh, Black Scale, um, The Hundreds. And I was like, oh, if you guys have clothing lines, I could probably have a clothing line. But I wanted mine to be a little bit more luxury. I wanted mine to be luxury street, not so street. And so that's how kind of not knowing that the retail experience gave me the conviction to, to go do what I needed to do or, or identify what was missing in the market. And then having like the, um, the firsthand relationship with these streetwear brand owners, I was like, oh, this is a real thing that I could do. And, and um, um, not, not self, what's the word I'm looking for? Conceitedly, I was like, if I can dress better than these guys, I could probably design better than these guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah. you know, if, if, if I'm maybe like one of the best dressed guys in my circles, I could, I'd probably have a better perspective on fashion than these other guys. And if they have brands, it's something that I think I can do. Yeah. And so 
that's kind of how I had like the conviction or like felt like it was a tangible thing that I could do. And in that time when I was, I wasn't Matt's agent, but I was just his marketing guy. And his agent kind of had more, I, don't, I guess everything I did had to go through his agent. So I was feeling like I needed to, to, to get a hold of something that I have full control over, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like I could, I could try and like direct Matt on where he should go with his brand or let's go to Nike and try and make the next King Griffey Jr. swingman. But I still had to go through some other layers and I was like, man, I need to do something on my own. I need to do something on my own. I heard you say that like, as you were like shopping for him, there was things you couldn't find. And so you're like, I'll just make it myself. Exactly. I was like, you know, what? I'll go downtown and I'll make it. I'll figure it out. My, my, my boys have clothing lines. It can't be that tough. Those first few pieces, uh, did you, in that moment, did you think I'm launching my own brand? Or were you just trying to fill a, a need? Uh, did you have a bigger vision? Uh, no, I was, I was doing it to kind of like fill a need personally, selfishly for myself. I was out five nights a week throwing parties. So I was like, I need clothes. I need to like, you know what I mean? I want to, I want to look different. I have a perspective that's not out there in the market. So in trying to help him and trying to selfishly, um, fix my own closet, it wasn't until I looked up and I had like three or four maybe five or six pieces. And I was like, oh, it's a little collection here, you know? And um, at that same time, I was visiting my parents. We did a a devotion, utmost for his highest devotion. And we were just talking about clouds and darkness around the kingdom of God and and talking about the layers and depths to God. And I was like, man, and I had this vision of God and it just looked kind of really cool, you know, for the first time. And before that, every vision of God not that he felt light but he just didn't feel like I didn't see him with this dark clouds around the throne and the layers to that and in my mind I was like oh my god this is a good foundation to build this clothing line on you know the the fear the fear of God because when you if you're in relationship with him you're you're at peace with him. But if, you, if you're not in relationship, you see those clouds of darkness as literal clouds of darkness and there's like a literal fear. So I loved this like juxtaposition of what fear of God meant. And so I was like, man, I, I've got this like foundation that I could build a brand on, have a real message. And if you know what the message is, you know that it's light. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about a real fear. I'm talking about a respect and a reverence but if you don't know it's kind of gangster it's, it's kind of intimidating and I like that and I like that play on that and I was like oh I can take these four or five six pieces that I have put them against this name fear of God and now I don't feel so corny coming up with a clothing line I feel like there, it's rooted in something and I kind of felt as much as I thought that I was good at clothing and styling I there was always something a little corny about being so caught up in in how you present yourself. It needed to be deeper and stronger than that. It couldn't just be a random clothing name and the brand is just about solutions for your closet. I think that it, it, it needed something like deeper. And so fear of God just gave me this like this foundation that I needed. And it gave me a, a, a drive to put behind the conviction that I knew. So there was, there was a conviction that I knew that there was something missing in the market. And there was also a conviction that I, I needed a platform to, to honor him. This is something that I, that I, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, at least I'm honoring God through this. Did you ever hesitate or think that the Christian connotation might relegate it? Like people wouldn't take it seriously because it's like, oh, it's a Christian company or something. Um, no, because I when I when I landed on the name Fear of God, I knew that it was gangster enough to like overcome this like Christian connotation. And I was like, oh, this is the way that like 
that this can work? Well, I mean, the early days of it, like if someone in Nashville had started a label called Fear of God, it wouldn't have worked, you know? Because it would have been like in the bubble, would have been relegated to the bubble. The fact that you weren't in the bubble at all, it's like, okay, that's just cool. Hmm. It's interesting, like you being out here and now, now you being in the church world mattered. I mean, like, it, or else it would have just been like Christian music or whatever. <laughs> like, not as good. It would have been DC talk. <laughs> no matter what, it's still DC talk. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't care if you're on that planet or not, you're still DC talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how did it go from, okay, you've got the name and a few pieces. I mean, how did you launch a company through all that? Was that the Big Sean and Kanye timeline? Yeah, kind of, kind of. I mean, all these people were, you know, because of the parties and because of who I was socially, it was easy to get my product to to the right people. And, it, and I did it. I like to think that was in a way that was organic, the same way that I threw parties. I never wanted to, like, beg someone to come out. I just really, I was like, yo, I, I know you need this long t-shirt kind of thing. I know you need this short sleeve hoodie kind of thing. I know this is missing, you know, rock it if you want, but, you know. And so I think organically just kind of took off. It got put on the right people. Um, Kanye got a hold of it, and um, he and I had never connected, but all of his close friends were really good friends of mine. Um, so we, we met, and... Uh, Atlantic City this was after my first collection and you know I showed him the whole collection and he's like he's like man this is amazing he's like dude can you be in Paris next week and I was like uh yeah he's like I want you to help me work on this APC collab and so you know all of the uh the magnifying glass that comes with working with someone as influential as him especially in that time you know five years ago um uh exposed the brand to a lot of people you know, and I think, I think exposure does two things: it either elevate you or like expose you, and whatever flaws that may be within uh, what it is that you're proposing to the world. And I think that um, because my perspective and my proposition in, in fashion is so unique to who I am, that it just kind of elevated the brand, um, and so from there first collection led to second and third and um now we're in you know our sixth collection and i remember the first collection i remember you doing like the yeezus tour merch or something right mm -hmm. and yeah so it's like it went from this kind of startup thing to like oh, okay now he's somebody to watch and then like collection two came out it seems like every collection is just it's just swelled i mean how'd you pull that off oh man i think it was just like conviction you know it's just like i knew what i was doing was different I knew my take was missing. Yeah, there's nothing like it because it's not streetwear. In the high fashion world, there was nothing like it from an outsider's view. So it's like you brought this edge to fashion. You elevate above or beyond what streetwear was going on. Yeah, wasn't what wasn't quite luxury at the time. It was this new space that I knew was going to be what is now. So I think at that, at that time, uh, Virgil had Pyrex. Um, Shane was Shane from Hood by Air was probably one of the first in that space to really kind of break through. Do you see that? Like, like you and Virgil are are the guys? Are you guys beginning a movement in Paris, or is this kind of like? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a movement. You know, um, I mean, what he's doing is far beyond where I'm at. I mean, he's creative director at Louis Vuitton. I'm still just making my stuff in LA, man. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're next, right? I mean. I'm, I'm next for whatever God has for me, man. I mean, it's like I, I can't look to that and all of a sudden have a new goal for what my convictions were. My, my goal was never to become, like, a creative director at a fashion house. Like, what if it was offered? I mean, I would consider it. I would consider it. I would, I would, I would look into it. But, you know, in, in high school, like, I, I couldn't tell you a fashion director, a creative director. Like, my all of my fashion comes from, like, making something out of nothing in your own closet. And all of my fashion is like a high school athlete. You know, how did we look in high school in the 90s, you know? It, it wasn't based on this, like, um, high level of uh, luxury... Um, uh, um, conceptual ideas that's never been my thing my thing is like how do I make this 
how do I make this Carhartt jacket work with this, uh, with these sweats and my Jordans? That's been my thing. That's, it's, it's this American fashion. I think now I'm able to like identify, oh, that's what we're doing. This is American luxury. This is luxury through an, through an American lens, not necessarily filtered through what's happening in Europe. A lot of people have dreams to start their own company and stuff. You, you're just working jobs, you're hustling. How'd you launch your own line with no investors? I mean, how'd you pull this off? Again, I think it's all conviction. I had like 14 grand saved up. Um, I, I think the, the conviction of what you're doing has to be stronger than your business plan. You know what I mean? Like your business plan is going to fail you. Your money's going to run out. But is that conviction still there? I launched on a much smaller scale. My company back in 2000, 19 years ago. Mm. No investors, just me. I was 24. Mm. And I have to blow it up and start o- over every couple of years. It's the conviction of trying like, okay, what's the dream? What's the goal? What's God calling us to? Okay, what are we going to be doing then that we're not doing now? Well, let's go do that. <laughs> you just got to keep moving. You don't need investors for that. You just have to have that clarity of vision and, and hustle. Exactly. You know, and it's just like, you know, at the end of the day, that's all you really have is like your this conviction of what you feel like God is calling you to do. I think people try to bite off too much. I, I, I think they start too big or they go and get investors so they can scale. Then the risk is a lot higher and a lot of people need to get paid. But if you can just crawl, walk, run this thing. What I, what I love about like I had a few pieces that I needed to make because mm-hmm. there was a hole in my closet, my client's closet. And then that kind of like, oh, I have a little collection here. It's an organic crawl, walk, run. You weren't trying to come out the gate and go change the industry or anything. I think that's why it worked, you know? And I think it's this like, and then there's this competitive side of me too that we touched on earlier as far as just growing up in sports. is like, I'm not going to be the best, but I'm going to be competitive. And so now, now that I'm in it, it's like, okay, I'm in it and I, I want to win. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I may not be the best, but I'm, I'm, I'm in here to, to win right now. You know, and um, I think there's something about that competitive nature inside and, and growing up in sports that you you take that competitiveness and you put it against conviction and you've got this little this little monster. You know what I mean? This little this little baby monster <laughs> kinda that um, that's gonna fight. You know, and I feel like there's been so many times where I could have not done what we did with Nike and I could have just maybe did an old Nike shoe, but, you know, we fought to do something new. We fought to propose something new. I fought to say, hey, when I was in high school, I didn't know about, like, collabs and sneakers. I just knew about Jordans. And that's the only emotional connection that I really have to sneakers. And if I can't make something that makes a kid feel like that, I don't know that it's worth us going through these motions, you know, and just having the conviction to say that, hey, what I'm really good at is like shape and silhouette. I feel like if I can help change the shape of a basketball shoe and I create a new shoe with Nike, we can maybe change culture together. And so... Do you believe a shoe shape and fashion can change culture? uh, I think... I don't think that God needs anyone or anything to influence or change culture. And I think that's what I learned when I was working with with Kanye for those three years so closely. Um, And and being able to work with someone who's so influential and being able to present to him my ideas and then watch him take those ideas and, and influence. It was almost like me saying that, oh wow, it's not necessarily him, but it's the gifts that have been given to him. And it's like, wow, God doesn't necessarily need a person or a platform. He just needs someone that's o- obedient, you know? And I was just like, oh wow, God could maybe do the same thing through me if I'm obedient and for me you know the question is do I think a shoe could change I think through obedience God can move through 
anyone or anything if he's trying to shift something, you know? And so I have to, as cool as I think that shoe is, I have to to really know where the favor is coming from. Because like it's, it's, you can quickly get lost in thinking that it's your talents that have you somewhere. And that's a scary place to be. And thinking that it's through your own will or through your own gifts that you're able to like to make these things happen when the reality is it's it's the opposite it's only through the obedience and I think that's when this gets tough it's just kind of like hey I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for like a, a greater purpose you know and it's 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 not about me in the end and um, someone else is responsible to write this big check and figure out how to get these employees to love each other and work together um, and I just give it to him um, but it can be consuming when you think that you can, you can, you have the capacity to do it all on your own. And that's where it's easy to kind of like begin to fail. You guys do it differently though, don't you? Cause maybe you don't have all these investors and board or whatever. You, you kind of have a freedom that you can follow conviction and do things you want when the way you want to do it, when you want to do it, which is unusual. Yeah, there's a freedom and with the, I mean, everything has a cost, right? So it's like, what's the cost of that freedom is you got to figure out how to do it, on, how to how to do it at a luxury level on your own. And fund it. You know, and fund it and not only fund it, but it's just like not having the resources that I could have access to overseas in Europe at better factories. And it's like you've, the cost of doing it on your own is figuring it out, figuring out how to make luxury product here in L.A., you know, with an investor, it'd be easier to make luxury product in Italy or Paris or overseas somewhere. But that also has a different cost of, as you said, investors and other people's desires of what they want the brand to be. So either way, you got to figure out which, what are you willing, what cost are you willing to pay for? You know, and for me, I've got to pay the cost of not only being a creative director, but being a CEO, being a president, being an HR director and... <laughs> every decision that, that goes into the brand. And yeah, I may own 100% of it, but at the same time, I got 100% of the headache too. And there's a cost to that, so. Um, if you had to do it over again, would you do anything differently? Uh, I've been asked that question before. I don't, I don't know that I'd be here if I took any other different route, you know? Um, and if I knew all the loss that I had to go through, all the all the losses, I don't, you know, it's, it's a little daunting, but because I was so blinded by conviction, you know, the losses didn't, didn't knock me out the way they should have, you know, you get more reason again, like the business plan fails you, you get more reasons to stop than you do to keep going. But when the tough stuff happens or you get stolen from or, or losses happen, do you feel like God's in that, that God allowed that to happen? and you need to learn whatever lesson, or is it discouraging you? Do you talk it up like, oh, it was my bad, not God's fault? Uh, how, how do you view that? How do you keep your faith and not get cynical in those moments? I don't, I don't know that, it's, that I'm always looking back and saying, oh, God, allow that to happen. But I do think things happen where God is saying, make sure you, you get the wisdom from that. Make, make sure you, you learn from that and, and you're, you're applying that going forward. And so... Um, a lot of things have happened and I've gained a lot of wisdom and I'm just now trying to make sure that I'm applying that as I continue to like climb, yeah. you know, as I'm continuing to move and as I'm continuing to go forward, am I, am I uh, applying the, the life lessons that have been, uh, that I've been exposed to and the things that I've seen and the things that have happened to me. That's a unique thing though. A lot of believers when they go, through hard seasons or get stolen from or whatever, they get discouraged. They blame God. Like, why would you let this happen to me? I, I, I'm doing this for you. In, in the back, I mean, I've always not, I've been a, a pessimist in that way, but I've always felt like the real test is going to be when I can't sell another sneaker and I can't sell another pair of jeans. It's like, where's my faith going to be? So it's, it's easy to, you know, to wave a faith flag when things appear to be well but like what happened where who is jerry when all this isn't popping you know that's like the real 
that's the test. So if your identity and your faith is in this thing and this thing goes away, what happens? Exactly. Yeah. You know, you, you're still going to stand and you know what I mean? And I feel like as tough as this has been and as heavy as this has been, um, that, um, not that I don't believe that God wants the best for me, but, um, who knows what, what I may have to endure to be an example for somebody else. Because at the end of the day, I know that this isn't all about me or for me, and it's for someone else. And I don't really know what the story is that God has for me to walk out that's going to bless and change someone else's life. And so um, I, I I think it just goes back to that like obedience thing that we touched on earlier. It's just trying to be obedient through it all, through the good, the bad. And and I think one of the things I've always kept in the back of my mind is kind of like this this too shall pass. And so how you ask me how do you deal about how do you deal with like tough times? Oh, it's going to pass. Well, the good times seems like it's popping right now. I'm not getting too high. It's going to pass. You know what I'm saying? Like, like everything is going to pass. And it's like, you've got to like, you've got to remain obedient to the highs, the valleys, the mountaintops, through it all. How do you keep that balance? Um, I think from a, I try to just feed myself constantly. You know, if, if it's me waking up at 536 before my kids get up to, to get my time in with God or... Um, You're a morning person. You do that? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I, and I'm knocked out by like nine thirty, ten o'clock. Come on. Oh yeah, I'm that dude. Put a movie on. But you were a nightlife guy. How, how do you pull that off? You had to be out like at, at night. You know what I mean? And I was drinking and stuff back then. I've been sober for three years. Yeah, it's nice, man. I appreciate it. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, being a family guy, it's like that's the only time that you kind of have to yourself if you beat everybody else up. And so, how, how have things changed? You being a family man now, business is exploding. Well, perspective continues to shift, man. It's like I, I was in Paris for a week, and I missed my son's first basketball game. And it's just like, you know, perspective continues to change. You know, where a lot of this, you know, if you ask me today, it's like I, I really just kind of want to be a little league coach. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of what I want to do full time, but now this has become a responsibility, um, and so it's the it's the constant balance, man, of trying to um, be a dad, be a husband, be um, a brand owner, and um, you know. And it, how are you dealing with all the pressure now? I mean, I, I feel like just from the outside looking at fear of God, you guys are at the level now that you got to have a million people wanting a piece of you. How do you handle that? I don't know if I handle it well. There's a lot of breaking points. I saw an Instagram post you did just a few days ago. It was a launch party you did, and your entire caption was apologizing to all the people you disappointed by not being able to invite them and give them free stuff. It's the weight of that. It's like you're here in a moment of celebrating, and you were having to apologize to all the people you were letting down. Exactly, dude. That's the the exact feeling. And that same day, like, my logistics manager quit. So it was just like, okay, cool, Jay-Z came to your thing, bro, but your head of logistics is gone and you got, you know, 30 sensitive dudes in your text message wondering why they're not there. So it's like this, like, constant balance, man, you know? And it's it's like the... My buddy gave me a painting the other day. My, my One of my best friends, my barber, he gave me a painting... And I like almost like started crying. I was like, man, it's been so long since someone just gave me something. Every text I get is like a ask for. And I didn't realize that until someone gave me something. So it's just like, oh, sh-. or excuse me. Oh, shoot. Um, man, like the, 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 when you realize like how much you're getting pulled on. You know, and then I don't know if I'm dealing with it properly. You ask me, like, how are you dealing? I don't know, man. I don't know that I'm dealing with it the best way. In our own business, I've, I've had seasons where we would have breakthrough and success in some things. And then, like, staff size would swell. And then all of a sudden, I realized I started in my life, I was serving 
that thing and I didn't want that anymore. So I would do things like I'd shut down stuff and I would intentionally pull back because I just got to think about, well, I need to be healthy. I need to be happy. I need to be excited and invigorated and passionate. And I'm not interested in maintaining this thing where like it's pulling on me and draining me all the time. So I've learned the hard way so many times, man, at our low level, I don't want that. Um, do you fear that if this thing keeps going, that all the things that are pulling and draining are just going to get more and more and more? Of course, man. And that's why it's just kind of like constantly, I think we talked about it earlier too, it's just like perspective, man. Like new perspective and it's just kind of like... Why am I doing it? Yeah, what's it worth? And just yeah. like understanding like who's in your life and why and like the 50 dudes that are like sensitive. It's like, you know what? Those, the people that love me, they, they really know that if I forgot, like, you know that I got you. You know what's on my plate. You know that I'm really just not thinking about you. And so it's like switching my focus and like my energy from those that may be pulling on me to the people that I know are like you know lifting me up and like um um and believe in me you know alan iverson said something at complex con is just you know it's important to surround yourself with people that believe in you you know and how surrounding yourself with people that may be doubting you or like pulling on you how how that could really have an impact and an effect on 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 how you produce in in life and whatever it is that you're doing and so um, I'm just super conscious of like the people that I'm close to and um, I, I, I don't do fake well I'm not good at being fake and so now that I'm like sober and I'm living a certain life like I'm, I'm used to like just being Jerry all the time and so when I'm in, in times where I need to kind of be a little uh, a little fake or a little LA like it's not comfortable for me and I'm I'm quick to kind of remove myself from those situations or relationships and so um from because the only way it stays pure is if if I'm just honest all the time yeah as soon as it starts getting like elements of um of uh phoniness you know it starts to like to lose to lose the uh the DNA of of, of, of what it is. I was asking our friend Carl Lentz how he deals with criticism because he, you ever read the comments on his Instagram? People love to tear him down. He said, as long as you've got five friends, five people who believe in you, he's like, I can list them. I'm all right. Because mm. if five people believe in me, then I'm all right. I don't care what anybody else says. I got the five. They've got my back yeah. and that's core. As a, this, this is, and I've said this before, this is not a Christian brand, but I'm a Christian human. And as a Christian man, I, I think I've come to the realization is like, it's not, your, your success is more determined in how you deal with the persecution. You know, it's not in, it's not so much in your craft. It's in how do you gracefully deal with those that are like throwing stones at you? You know, how do you, how do you represent for what you believe in those times? You know, I think, you know, the persecution is going to come, you know, and I think in anything that you do, especially doing something for the kingdom, like you got to be ready for that. And it's in how you deal with that, that I think ultimately um, you're measured by even more so than the shape of that sneaker. You're disrupting in a fashion world that doesn't like disruptors. And I can imagine there's a trajectory where everybody is all about you right now because that's the thing to do. But then. They love to tear it down too, build it up, then tear it down, mm -hmm. and that's coming if it's not already happening. Yeah, yeah, it's happening. And for me, um, from a a brand perspective, that's why we're just like, I'm, I'm trying to be Ralph Ralph Lauren to still to still a Jay Z line like I'm playing for forever. You know, I'm not trying to be the hot brand. The last thing I want to be is like hot, you know, because hot cools down. I'm trying to be like in the game forever. And so that's another reason why you mentioned it's like the crawling, you know, I'm not trying to get too far too quick. I want to have a, a foundation to fall on. You know, if, if the next thing I do isn't working, I've got like a strong foundation just underneath that. That is, you know, there's never a fall, uh, a, a, a far fall from like 
you know and so that's why we're trying to build slowly so like you know I, I know my DNA and I know next season and how we can evolve it not too far just a little bit to like bring my consumer along and educate him slowly and so it's more just like this long term approach and I think for me because the brand is, is named Fear of God like I can't sell it I'm kind of stuck with it so it's not like a build this thing up to like sell and make a lot of money I saw on Instagram those sponsor posts and the audio starts playing right away and there's this like Tony Robbins one and the very first line says it was to entrepreneurs he goes if you don't have an exit plan you're just employed I'm like I just want to launch this thing relevant and do it forever. I, I feel the same with fear of God. Um, there's not an exit plan, is there? No, there's no exit plan. And I'm, I'm cool with being an uh, employee, if that's what that means, in Tony's mind. I know, right? Tony, we're not flipping businesses here. Yeah, like, are you, are you finding your, your, your freedom in being unemployed and having a bunch of money in the bank? Is that how you're defining freedom then? Is that because I'm, I'm defining freedom in, in being obedient? Yeah. And the ability to create. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think luxury and um, luxury is freedom, you know. And I think for me, like, I am in my freedom. You know, I come to work with sweats and hair looking crazy. That's that's something that a lot of people can't do, you know. And so um, I feel like I'm I'm operating in my freedom and I... I, I feel like the only boss I have is is the greatest creative director of all time and I'm okay with like being his employee if that's what that's described as <laughs> that's great man okay a couple more questions I, I know they're wanting to get shooting do you ever feel the tension of being an outspoken believer in an industry where like there aren't very many I mean you're posting T.D. Jakes clips online and talking about your faith openly you ever get pushed back about that do you ever get like criticized or do people just accept it like that's part of your personality? Um, I, th- I catch some criticism. I think I found a way to do it in a way that feels honest. That like, because at the end of the day, like I'm not pushing Christianity, and I like. But you're so open about it. That's a crazy thing. Some some be like, I'm a believer. I have a Christianish name on my company, and then that's the end of it. They don't talk about it anymore. But you you're honest about it because i mean i just feel like at the end of the day like you just got to be about what you're about you know what i mean and like you know when i first started this brand like i i wasn't living the way that i needed to be living and it wasn't until you know three years ago that i made some changes in my life and rededicated my life to christ was that three years ago i know you got sober three years ago but you really rededicated your life at the same time yeah really what happened what prompted that uh i had kind of stopped running with it a certain crew and um, I just was at a super like lonely place in my life and I had a brand called Fear of God and I was had an alcohol problem and I was just like this like living these two different lives and I was just like you know what God like if, if you don't want this thing for me take it away but know that like that I'm doing this for you and I changed my life like it was in a day like I went to one AA meeting and um, I didn't want to speak over my life that I was an alcoholic so that's the only one I went to <laughs> there's power in words man yeah yeah and I just you know I really believe that you know my old self died on the cross when when, when Christ died on the cross and that um, um, I really believe that I wasn't who I was and I believe that I was who who I was who, how God saw me. I really believe that. And I was just able to like walk in that. I don't know where I got that strength from, or I think it just kind of happens when you, you hit rock bottom, you know, it's just you and God. I was just, you know, take this from me. People drink for different reasons, coping, pressure, escapism, yeah. trying to have fun, whatever. What was it for you? Uh, I think I was the party stuff. So it was just a lifestyle thing that continued? I think it was a lifestyle thing. You know, and then, then it became, like, in order for me to be social, like, I needed a drink. So, like, as soon as I got to the club at, like, 10 o'clock before anybody else got there, I was like, all right, let me get a drink just so that I can, like, deal with people. You know? Yeah. And then it becomes, like, this crutch, and then it and then it unlocks, like, you know, all these other inhibitions, and you're able to, you know, operate in a way that you think is honest, but is really dishonest to who you are. 
I think that's the biggest like lie is that alcohol like shows people who you really are and I think it shows people who you aren't you know I think I think when you're when you're sober is you 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 are who you are at that time you know um, your inhibitions are there because you have them there for a reason <laughs> you know just because you know alcohol takes away an inhibition it's not revealing who you are deep down it's it's causing you to be someone who you're not you know I think it's just it's a simple way of how I saw that you know Did having kids change something for you like little eyes watching um it, it helped it helped I mean when I had them I was still dealing with my same problems it wasn't until later but I think being in a sober state I was able to really understand like um the responsibility of being a father and being a husband and it, the clarity that comes with that and you're able to see like oh wow so you ask about the Instagram post like I'm really doing that because I know like my son is looking you know it's not it's not so much the millions of people it's like my son is going to look up you're documenting see. your life for your kids I went through a, a divorce yeah. five years ago I was so mindful during that the hardest seasons that my son's nine now he was three when she left I was just mindful that I I want to live in a way that if he, God forbid, ever had to go through something like this, if he did everything that I do, I'd be proud of him. And social media is the same thing. It's a digital record for the next generation to learn who you are. I'm, I'm mindful of that. It's a powerful thing. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, we're talking about luxury and kind of God using it to impact culture and stuff like that. What would you say to critics, pri- primarily probably in the church who would say like Jesus wouldn't spend that kind of money on clothes easy man I feel like God has called us to do the best that you can possibly do and it costs a lot of money to express yourself at the highest level so I think I don't think God has given me gifts and talents to compromise the gifts that he's given me he's given me the gifts and talents to like express myself at the highest level and I'm just trying to express myself through clothing at the highest level and that costs a lot of money to do you know like the buttons and the finishing and uh, yeah it could be cheaper but I can't afford to compromise my perspective at this at this moment for price you know and I, I think God has called us to excellence and um, um, I, we, we do have a lower tier brand and it's um, it started off it was called Fog and now it's called Essentials because to me it felt like dishonest oh, I'm just making something at a lower price point so you can have access to it. And so now we've changed the name to Essentials and hey, this is the best Essentials, base, best basics for your closet and it just is what it is. You know, I think when you compromise anything, I think it becomes dishonest. And so I'm not in the business of like compromising what God's given me, especially for price. <laughs> That was Jerry Lorenzo. Make sure to check out our cover story with him in the new issue of Relevant, which is out now. You can pick it up on newsstands nationwide or view the whole thing at relevantmagazine.com. And you can check out Fear of God's sixth collection online at fearofgod.com. And make sure to follow Jerry on Instagram at Jerry Lorenzo. Hey, if you like this episode of Unedited, I'd love your help spreading word about the show. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing it on iTunes helps a ton, as well as sharing it on social media. We love seeing the feedback. And you won't want to miss our next episode when I'm joined by my friend Abner Ramirez, probably best known as one half of the popular group Johnny Swim. They have an amazing new album coming out in a few weeks. We talk about that, relationships, basketball, Fixer Upper, and a lot more. You won't want to miss that conversation. Well, I'm Cameron Strang. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next time. Relevant Podcast Network.